welcome to M1 Church on this Christmas Sunday morning. Um, if you're in Indiana or the Midwest or over the upper half of the country, then you realize that God did partially give us a, a white Christmas along with frigid temperatures and ice and wind. Uh, for us here at M1, it was a very tough decision not to have service on this Christmas Sunday morning, but we do hope you'll understand. But I'm Pastor Jeff, and it's good to have you with us. Merry Christmas. Uh, I do want to share a special Christmas message. And at the end of it, I want to share communion with you. If you're a believer of Jesus Christ and, and you can participate in communion, then please take some time and prepare your elements, the, the bread and the juice, and we'll have this special time in just a few moments. While you prepare your communion, uh, I want to share a couple of things with you. There are a lot of different characters we have this time of the year in society, don't we? Santa, elves, reindeer, snowmen, um, all mostly based on make-believe. You know, St. Nicholas uh, was the basis for Santa Claus, but uh, the reindeer, snowmen, elves, uh, pretty much make-believe. At Kroger this week, I heard there was a snowman going through the vegetable section he was sorting through the carrots, apparently picking his nose out. And there was also a snowman. Uh, he was going through the snack aisle, and he, he couldn't find the ice krispies. But he did find the favorite snack of St. Nicholas himself, Jolly Ranchers. I also heard that uh, at Walmart this week, there was a gingerbread man. He got a bed for Christmas, and he was looking for new cookie sheets. Hey, humor is warm for the soul, and this time of year with the weather we have, all of us could use a little warmth and hopefully um, have a little smile, uh, right? There are a lot of different characters that we have this time of year based on fiction and make-believe. Today, I want to briefly look at the different people of the nativity. Some might say these people are, are characters, they're fictitious, make-believe, or maybe just religious fable made to capture our hearts and, in some cases, our wallets. I believe God's word is revealed to us for our benefit so that we can know God and that we could live with him and live for him. So let's look through the people of the nativity, and may we be reminded of the incredible way God shares, the, 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 gives us insight to these people, how each of them were tempted to be afraid and God replaced their fears with confidence. And God always has the bigger picture in mind, sometimes when we can only see the present. The first person, the first being I want to look at is Gabriel. He's revealed in scripture by name. First in Daniel 8, 16, where this angelic being, Gabriel, interprets a vision God gave to Daniel about the end of time. And then in Daniel 9, 22, Gabriel also appears to Daniel and, and instructs him to write about the anointed one. We know that today to be Jesus. And then some 500 years later, Gabriel appears first to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and then to Mary. And then although he's not named, an angel, an angelic being appears to Joseph in a dream. 500 years after appearing to Daniel. This tells us that angels do not age and that they are immortal. Mark 16, 5 shares how a young man dressed in white was sitting on the tomb of Jesus when the ladies arrived to put spices on his body and to anoint his body after he had been laid in the tomb. This being looked like a young man, similar in human form, but he was actually at least 500 years old he was existing in a body that did not decay. He was someone that will live forever. And we read in Luke 119 that Gabriel stands in the presence of God. He, he said that uh, to Zechariah. He said, I've, I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. Gabriel's God's official messenger, the one who delivers the good news of God's son. Gabriel also reveals the name of the Savior of the world, the King of the universe, Jesus. Gabriel represents to us 
the possibility of eternal life. Since God created an eternal, immortal beings like angels, then God's promise to give us eternal life is justified by revealing an angel like Gabriel. Gabriel also represents the interaction of angels and people. You see, God, God sometimes deploys the use of angels to speak with people. Gabriel's appearance was frightening to Daniel, to Zechariah, to Mary and Joseph. In each of their, uh, the appearance that he has to each of these people, he always quotes this line, do not be afraid. In Gabriel, each of us were given the message from God today, do not be afraid, regardless of the economy or inflation, deflation, work situation, the weather, regardless of what's going on in your life, you don't have to be afraid. God is with you. Gabriel shares a sentence in Zechariah that's so encouraging for us today. Luke 1, 37, he said, for, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Can you say amen to that? God can deliver a baby through a virgin. God can send an angel to speak to anyone, anywhere, at any time. God can share the future. God can give wisdom. God can give insight beyond the present moment. God can heal a person with COVID. God can heal a person with the flu or a cold like myself this morning. God can even heal a person with cancer, a person who's paralyzed. God can even raise a person from the dead. See, God can give eternal life. And so in Gabriel, he's a very special part of the Christmas story. And we're given the message, do not be afraid for nothing is impossible with God. The next person I want to look at in the nativity is Mother Mary. This teenage girl was told by Gabriel that she would deliver God's son to this world. Now, at first, she questions the possibility since she was a virgin. And Gabriel tells her, do not be afraid. God is directing her life. Mary's response is one of worship. We read in Luke 1, verses 46 through 48, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Mary accepts this good news. And she rejoices and glorifies God. She also acknowledges her humble state. Mary's not proud. She's not arrogant. Mary isn't selfish. She's not focused on um, what this news will do to her life. Because Mary has acknowledged that her life is not her own. Not her own. She belongs to God. And whatever God wants to do with her life, Mary's good with it. She rejoices in this good news. And for some, it would be devastating news, life-shattering, horrible. But to Mary, it causes her to rejoice and glorify God for realizing her humble state. Mary is a reminder for us today, our life is not our own if we're truly living for God. And for us to be in a humble state, no matter what comes our way, good or bad, be humble, be humble and realize you don't have to be afraid. Nothing's impossible with God. Mary's a wonderful example of someone living for God, loving God and sharing God. The next person I want to share from the nativity is Joseph. Joseph, he was just a, a carpenter, no working man, just an ordinary guy. And he actually finds out Mary is pregnant before Gabriel comes and speaks to him in a dream. Matthew 1, 19 describes Joseph as a just, just man, an upright man, not wanting to make Mary a public example of adultery or an illegitimate pregnancy. The description of Joseph is one of a caring and compassionate guy, not concerned with his own reputation or what everyone else thinks. He's concerned about what is right. Gabriel comes to Joseph and shares God's plan on how he is to take Mary to be his wife and how they are to complete their marriage and how Joseph would have one of the greatest 
honors in history that he would be the one to officially declare the name of God's son as Jesus. We read this in Matthew 1, verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke up from the dream that, that, um, in which Gabriel appeared, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home and his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she had given birth to a son. And Joseph gave him the name Jesus. Jesus. Joseph is the example of an ordinary guy being led into an extraordinary situation. Joseph was living for God. He was upright, justified, living with integrity, honesty, and transparency. Joseph became a man the entire world would know about because he did what God asked him to do. And that was to take Mary and to take Jesus and to give him the official name, Jesus. Joseph's a very special part of the Christmas story. The next characters in the nativity I'd like to share are the shepherds. Like Joseph, the shepherds were just ordinary guys. In fact, shepherding was not a job that many people aspired to in that day. Today, shepherding would be like a job making minimum wage, having terrible hours, and uh, not exactly the greatest working conditions. It, you may even describe it as having a lower class job. Nothing wrong with that, but that's how it, would, was, how it was looked at back then. According to two, Luke 2.8, two, the shepherds uh, were watching their flock by night, just minding their business when an angel appeared to them. One of the questions I have is, why these shepherds? What did God see in them? Now, this angel appears, and it was probably Gabriel again, although he's not named in the passage. He told the shepherds that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. And for the Jewish people, this is what everyone was waiting for. For generations, this was big news. God chose these shepherds. Why? God chose them to be the eyewitnesses of the birth of Jesus. The angel told them to go to Bethlehem, look for a sign. What was the sign? Something very familiar to shepherds, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. This, the shepherds knew what a manger was They're around it all the time. And they probably knew where every manger was in Bethlehem. So how did they respond? Did they, they call up a, a sub temp service and say, Hey, we need someone to come out and watch our, our flock by night. No. They didn't dilly-dally around. They just left. We read in Luke 2, verses 16 through 18, they hurried off. They just, they got the news and they responded. They took action. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds were not only chosen by God to be eyewitnesses of Jesus, they became instant evangelists, spreading the word, sharing what they had witnessed, telling everyone what they had been told, that this is the Messiah. The shepherds are great examples of ordinary people being chosen by God to share extraordinary news. The shepherds prove you don't need a degree in evangelism to share uh, Jesus with others, or to talk about the good news. The shepherds are a great part of the nativity and the Christmas story. The next uh, elements or the next people in the uh, nativity are the magi. Some call them the wise men. Um, we're introduced to them as they appear from the east. They enter Jerusalem looking for he who has been born king of the Jews. Now, we don't know how many magi there were. Uh, we, we put the, the number three on them because that's how many gifts they brought. They brought three gifts. And so in scripture, we just assume that there are three wise men, three magi. But uh, we can also deduct from scripture that they must have been noblemen and probably had uh, some type of diplomatic pedigree and probably had some diplomatic 
immunity. And the gifts they presented were fitting of a newborn king. Uh, they were symbolic of wealth, luxury, and affluence. The Magi, as they approached, they probably had a large entourage, making their presence in Jerusalem hard to conceal. They entered Jerusalem, and immediately they seek information from King Herod. Now, if you've ever studied the life of King Herod, Herod was not a good man at all. He was very paranoid about his power, his position, and his place in, in the ruling class. He did not value the lives of others. He was known for violence, vengeance, and he had the power of Rome at his disposal. Herod's, res Herod's response to the Magi also reveals several things. The Magi show up, and Scripture tells us that Herod is troubled in all of Jerusalem with him, Matthew chapter 2, verse 3. But notice Herod doesn't have the Magi apprehended, or he doesn't command that they come to him. Instead, they request an audience, and Herod gives it. Ah, they must be noble. They must have some type of power. They may have diplomatic immunity. But Herod gives them an audience immediately. They have a reputation. They're respectable. Um, they were asking about a new king. They needed information about the location of this newborn king. And so Herod puts the question of the baby's location to his wise men, his scribes and his priests, his religious people. And they quote scripture. In Bethlehem, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod secretly then finds out how long the Magi had been following the star, and that gave Herod the, the birth date of the newborn king. And then he asks the Magi a special favor that when they find the baby, send word back to him so that he can come and worship him too. The word that comes to my mind is liar. Herod had no intent of going to worship. In fact, after he finds out that the wise men had taken a different route back home, Herod immediately issues a decree to have all newborn babies two years and under massacred. Herod is not deserving of any proper recognition. He was an evil, vile person who will be judged by the king of the universe for his despicable actions. But the Magi, when they left Herod, they continued their, their journey and they followed the star of Bethlehem. Now, some say that this star was um, uh, actually the glow of Gabriel flying around to the shepherds and Joseph and Mary and, and watching over the entire process of the birth of Jesus. Some say, and I like this, that the Bethlehem star was God's nightlight for Jesus. I like that. Now, Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. When the Magi saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. They bowed down and worshiped him, and they pre opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The Magi were chosen by God to represent the best in this world, honoring his son. The Magi were obedient to follow the star of Bethlehem, the nightlight of Jesus. The Magi put their money where their hearts were. They sought out Jesus, and when they found him, they gave him their best. They didn't give an excuse for not giving their best. You know, the trip cost so much. You know how many people we have on our payroll? We just couldn't afford to give you anything better. Here's a card. Here's something that we want to re-gift to you. Huh? Not the Magi. The Magi honored baby Jesus with their best, regardless of the cost. And they're great examples of what it takes to seek out, what it means to seek out Jesus and to give him our best. And so that brings us to the final person of the nativity, the best, baby Jesus. Jesus is the focus of the nativity. Jesus is the Christmas story. Gabriel, Mary, 
Joseph, the shepherds, the Magi, they all point to Jesus. And today he still is the reason for the season. You know, I'm in, in the appointed brothers quartet. And uh, one of the songs we do is the baby drew the line. And one of the lines says that he drew the line between time, BC and AD. Jesus drew the line. He cut history in half. He made a way from God to man, from God to us, from God to you. We're all created to be God's people. We read in Matthew 1, 21, Mary will give birth to a son, and you already give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This Jesus, who knew the royalty of heaven, he knew what it felt like to be honored by angels, to be divine, to be eternal. And yet Jesus came humbly in the form of a little baby. He was put in the care of a carpenter and a teenage girl. Jesus took off his divinity and put on the frailty of human flesh and bone. He limited himself to our hurts, our hangups, and our habits. Jesus, who was all God, became all man so that each of us could have a personal relationship with him today. Jesus came to be the greatest gift for everyone, not just the rich, the famous, not just for royalty, but for all people, for all people, for you, for me. Now, today is Christmas Day, and most of the world will celebrate Christmas in some way. And I don't want to even imagine how many will leave the Christ child out of their celebration of Christmas. They'll be trading gifts and taking time off of work and getting together with family and friends. But for his people, it's a time to reflect and celebrate and thank him for the great gift of uh, the forgiveness of our sin, for salvation, and for the possibility of eternal life. And in just a few moments, we're going to remember the gift of Jesus through communion. Christmas is the greatest time to celebrate the sacrifice of his body and our blood and his blood for our salvation. But I, again, I remind you communion is not for everyone. It's for those who have committed their lives and given their hearts to Jesus Christ. If you haven't received Christ as your personal savior, then I'd like to invite you to do so at this moment. What a better day than on Christmas. It's as easy as a B C a personally ask Jesus into your life. God is a gentleman. Jesus Christ is the, the ultimate gentleman. He will not invade you. No one can be forced to become a believer or a follower. You have to personally invite him. You, you choose by your will and your desire to become a, a Christian. And then B, believe in Jesus. Believe he is the son of God. Believe that he was born to a virgin. He came and did miracles and, and taught and showed us how to love and how to attain eternal life. Believe he is who he said he was. And then C, commit. Commit the rest of your life to live with him and to live for him. Becoming a Christian is easy as A, B, C. A, ask. B, believe. C, commit. I'd like to have a, a word of prayer with you, and then we're going to have communion. Father, I just thank you for every person listening to the sound of my rustly voice this morning. And uh, thank you for the opportunity we have together like this. And if there's someone who they've, they've not yet invited you into their heart, I pray that they will hear your voice and uh, realize that you're knocking at their heart's door. And I pray that they'll, they'll open that door and invite you in and that you will fellowship with them and that a new relationship will be formed. Thank you for the gift of Christ. Thank you for the sacrifice, for taking our place, for the punishment of our sins. We love you. We praise you. And for those who have invited you into their hearts, Lord, I pray that you will just let this be the greatest day of their life. Let it truly be Christ must, more of Christ. It's in your beautiful name I pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to um, share communion. And so on this special Christmas day, 
uh, we're going to thank him for his body. Simply take the wafer that you have and um, uh, and prepare to to eat it. It it represents the, the body of Christ and how he took our sacrifice. Uh, he became our sacrifice. All of us should be punished for our sins, for rebelling against God, for our bad attitudes and the things that we've done to separate ourselves from God. But Jesus bridged the gap and he allowed his body to be beaten up, tortured, abused, and even executed all because he loves us. And so as we take and, and eat the wafer, then remember the body of Jesus and celebrate it. Jesus told us as he was meeting with his disciples at the last supper, he passed around a cup of wine and he said that the, the wine was, is not just wine. It was to represent his blood his sinless blood. His blood was shed and became the covering, the anointing, the, the redemption of our sins. His sinless blood covers our sin-filled lives so that we, when God looks at us, he doesn't see all the ways that, that we've lied or, or coveted or, or just rebelled. He sees us. He sees the blood of Jesus covering our lives. And that makes us his children. That makes us his sons, his daughters. And so as we drink uh, this morning, uh, and I left my cup over there, but as we drink the juice, if you will, remember the blood of Jesus and personally thank him for the sacrifice of his blood. Amen. Well, again, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, on this special day, Christmas, uh, we're reminded of the, the people of the nativity. Gabriel, who shared the good news of the birth of Jesus. Mary rejoiced in her soul and glorified in her spirit. Joseph proclaimed Jesus, the name of Jesus to the world. The shepherds went out and became evangelists. They told what they had seen and what they had experienced. And the Magi journeyed. They sought out Jesus and they gave him their very best. As we prepare to end this Christmas day, may we use their examples. Let us go out into this crazy world filled with many different characters and crazy, crazy times. Let's share what we've seen. Let's share what we've experienced. And that's the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. God bless you and yours on this Christmas Sunday. Merry Christmas.